Pilates is focusing on core, but it's not really focusing on strength. We have to think about as we get older, what do we want to be able to do? If you fall, you want to be able to get up in lower body strength. And of course, walking speed, grip strength. These are the things that you know we test that we know will be predictive as a biomarker or predictive marker for issues later on. Resistance exercise, contracting skeletal muscle against force, against other types of weight and full movements are, are critical. So is Pilates enough? No. Is Pilates beneficial? Totally. Dr. Gabrielle Lyon received her doctorate in osteopathic medicine from the Arizona College of Osteopathic Medicine and is board certified in family medicine. She earned her undergrad degree in human nutrition from the University of Illinois, where she studied vitamin and mineral metabolism, chronic disease prevention and management, and the physiological effects of diet composition. She also completed a research clinical fellowship in nutritional science science and geriatrics at Washington University in St. Louis. And what I find so interesting is she's coined this practice of what she calls muscle-centric medicine, which can benefit your muscle health through a protein-smart diet, exercise, and lifestyle shifts, which is what we're going to discuss today. Gabrielle, welcome. Hi, Jason. So happy to be here. So great to finally have you. I am fascinated by what you call muscle-centric medicine. So, so let's start there. How do you define muscle-centric medicine? Muscle-centric medicine is this concept that muscle is the organ of longevity, and it really dictates everything about health and wellness. Right now, we are so focused on obesity. Um, and I would argue that we are not over fat, but as a society, we're actually under muscled and muscle has always been the star in the fitness world. And really, as it relates to aesthetics and athletic performance, the reality is though muscle is an endocrine organ and it secretes myokines when you contract it. It is an endocrine organ, just like the thyroid is an organ. And it interfaces with all systems in the body in a much more potent way than any kind of one single medication. And the concept of muscle-centric medicine is that muscle is the pinnacle, not the periphery of health and wellness. Leads me to a lot of questions in terms of what, what is enough? You know, I, I think I tend or we tend to think of longevity and, and there's certain you know, biomarkers, if you will, you want to focus on. So, you know, maybe it's ApoB if you're concerned about cardiovascular health. Maybe it's you know, your fasting insulin, insulin if you're concerned about uh, your metabolic health and the list goes on and on. But how do you think about muscle in terms of what's enough if we're concerned about longevity, whether that's, you know, maintaining, building, are certain muscles, do certain muscles matter more? You know, do our biceps count or is it really about our quads? So like, how do you think about defining, like how does one know, okay, I'm in a pretty good place in terms of my muscle composition with regards to longevity? That is a really good question. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna answer that question two parts. You asked how much is enough, how much is too much? And I would say from a medical perspective, how we, you know, there's this uh, body mass index, which is really focused on obesity, but there's also an appendicular skeletal mass index. This is not commonly used. We use it in geriatrics and it's a way of grading, you know, how much someone's, how much someone has in terms of muscle mass divided by height, right? Meter squared. Um, it's kind of arbitrary. And really the goal of it is to determine if someone is say sarcopenic. Now I'm speaking just in terms of medicine, but from a practical aspect, we never know someone's capacity. So for example, Jason, I don't know how much muscle mass would be optimal for you. Even myself, I would not know how much muscle mass would be optimal for me. And I think muscle in itself is a very difficult tissue to study, unlike fat. So fat is very homogeneous. 
meaning, you know, really the adipose cells are typically all the same. Muscle has all these different fibers and everyone has a different fiber composition type, whether it's a type one fiber or type two fiber, uh, type two X fiber, you know, these kinds of things. So muscle in and of itself is just a very complex topic. That being said, proper training early on is going to be essential. And perhaps that didn't give you an exact number of how much, how many pounds of high quality skeletal muscle mass you would have and how much you would need. I don't think anybody can ever answer that in terms of what is optimal. We know how much is disease related, right? If you have too little, we have a number, um, how much would be say sarcopenic, but we don't know how much is optimal. And nobody at this time can answer that. You know, sarcopenia is very real and, I, and I, maybe in my case with a little bit of an exaggeration, but, I, but I'll share the story because I, I, think, I think it's interesting. So I'm um, 47, I played basketball through college, which, you know, now it's like 25 years ago. And I, I've always, you know, gone to the gym for the most part of my life. However, once basketball ended, I never enjoyed doing legs. I'm just like, I'm done with this. I'm done. My legs are strong. I'll take the stairs. I don't like running. I, I, so I'll, I'll walk. I'll take the stairs. That's how I'll get my legs in. I, I would stick to the upper body. And I feel like I'm in great shape, probably like maybe the best shape in my life. Um, and my weight's been consistent. I'm six, seven. My weight's been consistent. Call between, like around 200 pounds, give or take like five pounds, but for the most part consistent which I think is where you want to be. And then about six months ago, and I, I don't really weigh myself either. It's about six months ago, I did get a scale. I'm like, I'll weigh myself. And I lost about 10 pounds. And I was like, what is going on here? Like what? Like I, I feel strong. I know what I'm, what, the weight I'm doing in the gym, it's about the same. And then I looked in the mirror and I, and I, I looked at, and I was like, oh my God, I'm losing my butt. <laughs> I'm, I'm losing my butt and my quads, but they're, they're sort of, cause I just haven't done leg work. And I was like, do I really care? And then, and then, you know, it started to pay a little bit more attention, you know, to your work and other, other people's work were emphasizing, you know, the importance of strength training and longevity. I'm like, I got to do something. And so, you know, I started doing squats. I started to, you know, just like lightweight, like I don't put weight because I've had back issues. Like I'm very reticent to put like, the one time I put weight on my back and started to do it like in the traditional sense in Iraq, I like tweaked my back. I'm like, I'm done. Like I'll just do the medicine ball, body weight. I'll just do more reps. And so I've started to do this and then my, my, my butt and my legs have started to come back. But, but to me, it was very real. It was like, oh my God, I haven't done legs for 25 years and now my butt's starting to sag. It's a little back. It's back. It's, it's back now. Not yeah. to work, you know, cause you know, as a basketball player, like basketball player, you know, basketball butt, so to speak. And I don't care about aesthetics. It was just like, fuck. <laughs> so I just want to say it's real. It's real. And, you know, you're highlighting something that is very valuable for the listener. And that is really if you train and do the things that you did when you were younger, you have to pay very particular attention because skeletal muscle, it's kind of the if you don't use it, you lose it. And, and that's one. And we've all heard that term. But the reality is, is skeletal muscle as an organ system changes as we age. It becomes more insulin resistant. It um, develops processes in it where it becomes less efficient to nutrient stimulation. And one of the things which I know we're going to talk about protein is that the muscle tissue itself requires stimulus. The good news is your butt <laughs> is starting to come back. You know. Um, the amount of muscle fibers that you have you're born with which is really important you know for you know mothers and things to be fit and active um because you're you're born with the amount of muscle fibers that you will have you can change it you can change obviously the diameter and 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 those kinds of things but what you are born with is what you have so you really have to take care of it and then as you age so you've laid a foundation of training. You've trained, you've been very athletic, you are very athletic, not to mention very tall. And what happens is, is, you know, there's this concept of muscle memory and muscle memory 
traditionally is thought of the neurological connections of, for example, you could probably pick up a basketball and, and you'd be able to do things that I would never be able to do. Uh, another component of the proverbial muscle memory is actually you will likely be able to gain strength back much more rapidly than someone who is building it for the first time, which is incredible. The other aspect is, can you imagine if you hadn't noticed that you were losing your butt? And in the next five years, there's this downward trajectory of muscle loss. Again, the, the tissue changes. And we've all seen it with our aging parents. And we've all seen it with the older individuals where all of a sudden they were big, robust midlife, and perhaps they didn't keep those habits. Uh, I know that you had mentioned um, or maybe we were talking uh, prior to recording, hormonal changes, men versus women, perimenopause, menopause, or even the non-medical term andropause, where testosterone decreases. These things are very real. And if an individual is not undergoing any kind of hormonal therapy, you really have to train. You have to shift your perspective of what it means for longevity. Right now, in terms of longevity, people think, protein restriction and doing yoga. And I would say that's really missing the mark when we're thinking about quality of life because you all, you've you got three kids or you've got- Two, two, two girls, two girls. They're young, uh, five and three. Five and three. So you kind of did what we did the, the two years apart. You want to be able to always pick them up. You want to be able to, I mean, maybe not when they're teenagers, you don't want to necessarily be bench pressing them, but you want to be able to always be mobile. And um, it's- to me, that's what longevity is, is that quality of life of being able to do what you did when you were younger and moving that forward. 100% agreed. And I think you brought up a good point. You know, men and women obviously differ with their needs and, and what's happening hormonally and physiologically as we age. So it, it brings the question, how should we be thinking about strength training Men versus women, twenties. I'm in my twenties, all the way. You know, we've got a we've got a great audience here, twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and so on. Like in terms of, you know, what's the bare minimum? What do we need to do in our twenties if I'm a man or a woman? And let's take it. I know it's a big question, but let's take it by decade. Let's talk about exercise as a treatment for multiple different diseases, right? There, there's a great paper out by a woman named Pedersen. She is, um, I think that she's in Copenhagen and she wrote an amazing review paper on exercise as medicine for chronic disease. And she outlined depression and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Exercise in and of itself, and, and I'm starting broadly, exercise as in cardiovascular activity, endurance type activity, resistance exercise, Exercise is more potent for whole body homeostasis, meaning bringing your body back into balance, counteracting the hallmarks of aging, counteracting um, issues with inflammation, issues with any kind of chronic disease. And, and I'm saying this broadly, many, I should say many kinds of chronic disease. It is the single most robust action any human can take any human can take in any decade. So I want to lay that at your feet. Now, starting in your 20s. In your 20s, you have a lot of flexibility. And I don't mean that um, literally, well, although that is true, you have a lot of flexibility as it relates to, remember in high school, I guarantee you were on the Twinkie diet right? You were haphazardly eating. <laughs> I ate terribly. I started to drink way too much and could get up at 7 a.m. and go play basketball for four hours. Right. And you were strong, probably had a ton of energy. And I mean, and the question is, well, wow, there's a lot of room for error for you and still progression. In your 20s, your hormones are very high, your testosterone is high, your growth hormone is high, you are driven by growth. So you can kind of eat whatever you want. Not that I'm recommending it, but the balance between diet versus hormones, you are much more hormonally driven. All the 20 year old listeners out there, you are much more hormonally driven. As that changes, let's say for example, um, you are a 20 year old who is sedentary. 
Now we understand that insulin resistance is one of the biggest problems that we're facing in modern society. Insulin is a peptide hormone that's released from the pancreas and it moves glucose out of the bloodstream into cells. And, and we've all heard this term insulin resistance, meaning you're requiring more insulin to do the same job. A key component to insulin resistance is skeletal muscle, right? Insulin resistance, one of the primary places that it starts decades before is in skeletal muscle. That's pretty profound because we're always hearing about obesity and insulin resistance. Like you become overweight and now you're insulin resistant. It, it, it actually starts maybe in your 20s, possibly, depending if you're inactive, and for sure in your 30s. It's now even more robust in your 30s. So in your 20s, you're hormonally driven. By the time you're in your 30s, there, there's probably changes that are happening where you're less hormonally driven. You're not growing taller. You're going to be growing wider. And this is where if you haven't trained with any focus by the time you're 30 you need to be i mean listen arguably everyone should be on a good program and the earlier you start the better but by 20 you need to be doing more than cardiovascular activity so cardiovascular activity you know the recommendations are 150 minutes of vigorous activity throughout the week that is likely not enough but having a good cardiovascular foundation, it's kind of what we talk about, that zone two training is critical for mitochondria. It's important for glucose utilization for the foods that you're eating. And um, overall, it provides a base, right? So you need it. And just just, just, what, just, just to clarify, I want to clarify zone two for a second because it comes up a lot and I just want to like kind of simplify it. So if we could just for one second, the way I simplify zone two, you tell me if this is correct, is you're doing something where you're slightly out of breath to some degree, you like kind of hold that you can hold a conversation, but kind of difficult. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that that's a, a great way to frame it. I did zone training um, yesterday for 30 minutes. I'm totally zone training out of shape, right? I've been really focusing on, on strength training, but it, you know, so then in your thirties, this is where again, resistance training and, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and I would recommend individuals at a minimum four days a week, four days a week of resistance exercise. And this will vary if you are um, a novice trainer, like let's say you haven't been training or right, you're going to make better gains. If you've never trained, you're going to put on muscle quickly. You might put on, you know, at the very high level, if you're a, a young male, you might put on a pound of muscle a month. Maybe you, you'll put on more. You know, again, this is nutrition and also training, very targeted training. If you're a woman, you might put on half that. Women don't put on muscle at the same rate uh, or in the same strength capacity as men. Um, is that hormonally driven? Probably, right? Probably. Um, so in your 30s, this is, and these are the recommendations I, I really believe everyone should be doing, and that's three to really four days a week of hypertrophy training. And hypertrophy training typically is a very easy to do, and this is really about growing your muscle, right? Just exactly what it sounds. Hypertrophy as opposed to maybe, um, you know, much heavier weight and much lower volume. The volume is important, and the volume simply refers to the amount of training that you're doing. So this is if you're doing five sets of 15, um, I would say you don't have to stop at 15 uh, reps because your muscle doesn't go, okay, well, I've hit 15 and now I'm done. It's really going to somewhat of perceived uh, exertion of, you know, in my opinion, maximum effort. Again, it's very difficult to make very specific recommendations from training. It's much more difficult for training recommendations than it is for diet recommendations. And there's a number of, and this is just my per, this is just my personal opinion. And one of the reasons why is because it's so difficult to quantify somebody's effort and focus and mind muscle connection. Whereas we, you and I both, Jason, have seen people that are going to the gym and they've never changed their body composition, but they're showing up and they're doing the thing and the program versus 
if someone is doing, okay, here's a structured diet. I've written this out. I want you to have um, 150 you know, or 200 pounds. I want you to have 200 grams of protein. I know exactly what you're putting in. And the way in which it can be measured is simplified versus, you know, is someone going to the squat rack like you were and actually stimulating the muscle necessary, the muscles necessary for squatting? You might not be. You might be using your back versus using your glutes. So it sounds like roughly in your 20s and 30s, four days a week of strength training, go to failure, you know, whether that's five sets, four sets, maybe doesn't matter, three sets per, per body part. And then in duration, how much, like, is it, again, I, there's variability on like how much rest you need. Theoretically, if you don't really rest between reps, sets, sets, could you do this in 20 minutes, 25 minutes? Let's say you're doing push ups, you're doing body weight stuff. Like, what, what do you think is kind of the bare minimum? I think it depends on the goal, right? If you are looking for full muscle recovery and, um, you know, let's say you're squatting or you're deadlifting, I would allow you to, in, in my perspective, to feel recovered, whether that's a minute, you know, maybe you're going to rest for a minute before you are going back to put in that effort. And that's different because we're talking about hypertrophy training. And listen, there's many ways to do it. You can do tempo training, meaning, you know, like you could go down in a squat and you could go four counts and then power up, you know, depending on, you know, there's multiple ways to train. I think one perspective is if you are tracking your training, like you are tracking your calories, you can then see improvements. So you are not haphazardly training. Do I think you could do it in 20 minutes? I think if you are, I think you probably need a longer time. If you are focused on hypertrophy and let's say you do, you are doing a higher volume, you're doing five exercises per muscle group, right? I'm just throwing this out there. It's going to be hard to get through the kind of volume in 20 minutes if you're focusing on a hypertrophy versus let's say you're going to do high intensity interval training because you want to work a, di a different system. Then you could get that done in four to 10 to 20 minutes. Right. Okay. So 20s, 30s, let's move on to 40s, 50s, and so on. How, do, how does it differ? This is where I see the biggest change clinically. And this is, um, you know, when I was doing research at WashU in St. Louis, this is the time where we see the biggest body composition changes. And, you know, in your 40s, 40s, 50s, 60s, this is the critical time. And two things have happened at this point. Either you've paid your dues and you have a great foundation, or all of a sudden you have a spare tire and you don't have the energy that you used to uh, and kind of like the wheels are falling off. This is the time when these hormonal changes, I think really making sure that you're adding in some high intensity interval training is critical. And why do I think that? I think that this is, it is very metabolically robust training. And that is, let's say you are doing 30 seconds in an all-out sprint or 30 seconds in an all-out effort for um, the Airdyne bike. You know, you're really looking at improving insulin sensitivity and people don't have the kind of time you typically, you know, maybe you've got a family, you know, you're reaching the pinnacle of your business because you've now put in all the work. This is where time, you don't have the luxury of time. High intensity interval training is very critical. Again, that's that could be done, I recommend twice a week. Minimum one time a week, but twice a week of some kind of high intensity interval training to improve insulin sensitivity, to um, you know, really start to train yourself to put in very focused effort. And then again, I also recommend the zone training, um, but you might not have time for the amount of volume that would be necessary and resistance training. So now if I were to prioritize, I would say resistance training, high intensity, high intensity interval training, and then um, cardiovascular training. So I'll, I'll tell you what I do. I kind of think I maybe hit all three. You tell me if what I'm doing is, is correct or I'm just, you know, winging it. Probably a blend of all of it. So two to three days a week, I will work out for call it 25 minutes. And I will do 
three sets each to failure. Usually it's like 15 is the first set and maybe like eight or 10 and then like six to seven. And I'll do that for each body part. So like I'll start with pull-ups and then I'll go, go there and I won't rest more than 30 seconds between sets. So I get my heart rate up at the end. I'll do again. I'm done with racks and squats because of my backs. I'll do air squats or I'll do the air squat with a medicine ball. And I'll do like as many reps, you know, 50 reps, 60 reps, 70, and I'll do it kind of fast. So I get the heart rate up. Then I'll, I'll jump rope. So I'm really getting the heart rate up. Okay. So you're, so you're I, really, you're doing a combination. This is incredible. Yeah, it sounds but, like a I don't have metabolic time. conditioning. Yeah. That's yeah, incredible. But I don't have time. So I want to like, I want right. to maintain my muscle mass. I want to, you know, make sure my, my butt doesn't, my butt and my legs don't disappear. No, your wife wants to make sure that. Well, it's not about, it goes back to, you know, I think getting uh, home with the kids. It's like, I've got young kids. Like right. our, I want to be able to pick that, you know, when they're a hundred pounds, I want to be able to pick them up. If they would choose <laughs> that, I want that ability. You know, I want to, I want to, you know, we live on the seventh floor. I'll take the stairs every day. Like it doesn't, I want to be able to do that. If that you know, I don't like elevators. If I want to take the stairs, 15 flights, I want to, I want to be able to do it and not freak out. So like that that's how I think about it. I think the way you framed it up of like think about what you want to be in your 70s and 80s. You want to be able to be active and do those things. I think we all want to minimize, you know, I think about quality of life and longevity. I, the way I think about it, you want to minimize <laughs> doctor's visits and unless of course I'm your doctor. Exactly. Well, yeah, but like <laughs> of course. You want to minimize time at the doctor's office, hospitals, and pharmaceutical interventions. You want to minimize that to like the, the way end, and then you just want to die. That's how I think about health span. And so with all that said, coming back to, I don't have the time. So it's like I, I have two, two, maybe three days a week. I need to kind of get everything in at once. Uh, so, so suffice to say, that kind of is effective for people who don't have time who are call it 40 plus to kind of do everything. I, I think that's a great strategy. And I would also say uh, two things to that. Number one, what you're saying is absolutely right. As we think about the later decades is the, the more lean muscle mass we have, the healthier, the lean muscle mass, the lower uh, our, or the greater our survivability across all cause mortality, right? The more healthy muscle mass you have, the greater your capacity to survive. The other thing is the time issue. And one thing I would say is, how do we know if you are doing the activity that is actually maintaining your body composition? We should track that. You should get a body composition DEXA so we know what is your muscle mass, what is your fat mass, what is your visceral fat, which is the fat around the organs in the belly. You know, um, I will just throw out there that something that's really missing is you don't just get fat around the organs, you get fat around the muscle and in the muscle, which we don't, as a medical profession, have a very easy way to look at that as a standard of care, uh, which really does affect the contractility, the strength, the, the peak force generation, all the stuff that you are talking about. So let's see if you're maintaining by actually tracking it. For you, it would be great to actually track. And then the next thing that I would say is you are definitely doing metabolic conditioning, which is incredible. My challenge to you would be, are you able to improve your strength? Are you able to perhaps go up in weight with the medicine ball? Are you able to do things that are that, that's actually pushing your physical capacity? The biggest danger that I see as people transition from 40 to 50 is that there comes a time where they stop pushing. I mean, you're going to failure, so you're really pushing yourself, but they, they kind of begin to back off. And I would say that that is, you know, we all have to be aware of our weaknesses and, and predictable human nature. That is a, a time frame where if an individual feels that they are doing it, then they really need to regroup and think, okay, I need to be challenging myself. Yesterday I was at the gym. So I, I lift heavy three days a week. I do heavy legs three days a week. Um, 
And I was watching some of the other trainers and they're working with older individuals, more mature individuals, which I like to say 60, maybe 60 or 70. And they were in there and they were all going through the motions. And the reality was going through the motions, you know, they were doing, you know, some of the, what do you call it? That can't remember the name of that, that band. It was made out of parachutes, whatever. Do you remember like the TRX? TRX. So I'm watching them do the TRX. I'm watching them do step ups with pretty lightweight. And every week I see them doing the same weight, barely progressing. And I realize that they are in there because they are wanting to protect themselves from falls. We know that falls is one of the greatest risk factors for um, disability. You know, if a woman over the age of 65 falls, she maybe has a 40, you know, could even be a 50% chance she's not going to walk again. And that's at the very high end, depending on if she has comorbidities. But this is like tragic. An individual falls, breaks a hip, they might not be getting out of the hospital. So anyway, long story short is I'm watching them do these things, thinking that they are um, knowing that their goal is to do activity pr to protect themselves and realizing that they're not working hard enough to do just that. So you cannot just show up in your 60s and 70s and just go through the motions. You have to really be cognizant of actually putting in effort and progressing because that, that wave of youth closes and the goal is to protect yourself from falls, to be able to throw your kids over your shoulder or do whatever it is you're doing. And that cannot be done if you are just showing up and going through the motions, which I will say is where blood flow restriction and, and these, these new suits like the Catalyst and these, um, you know, they have like these smart machines that I think were originally created for NASA, where they're uh, machines that really track the weight. These kinds of things um, become very important because you're able to target effort. You know, when you, you bring up effort and people pushing themselves, what I think of and when things go wrong is you push and you don't have great form and you have a weak core. And when your your core is weak, that's when things just go all wrong. And, and I see this all the time. I'll see it with, with men specifically. You'll see a guy and it's like, he just wanted arms and he's got like biceps. And then the rest of his body is like completely out of, it's just, it's like, I, <laughs> um, with all that said, I think it's safe to say <laughs> biceps are not the muscle. Biceps and triceps are great muscles, you know, work them, but that's not really where you want to focus and where i'm going is you know many of our listeners most of our listeners are female and pilates seems to be having a big moment again it seems to be back when pilates you're, you're focused on the core which is fantastic for those who love pilates is pilates alone sufficient in my professional opinion it's not and again, because it, it's amazing and it's helpful and it's one modality. We have to think about as we get older, what do we want to be able to do? If you fall, you want to be able to get up. You know, when I ran a, you know, I'm trained as a geriatrician. And one of the things that we always test is um, the sit and stand test. So it's really testing lower body strength. And of course, walking speed, grip strength. These are the things that, you know, we test that we know will be predictive as a uh, you know, as a biomarker or predictive marker for issues later on um, and just issues in general. But also if people are robust and strong, then we know that they're in, in a good spot. Pilates is, is, again, focusing on core, but it's not really focusing on strength. There's some aspects that are strength, but again, I think really loading the lower body, being able to be able to move weight is critical. So Pilates is a great tool. Um, but again, resistance exercise, contracting skeletal muscle against force, you know, and I guess Pilates is doing that, but against other types of weight and full movements are, are critical. And, you know, at least in the literature, that's what we see. Resistance types exercise, compound movements, um, you know, adding in cardiovascular activity to secrete these myokines. You know, this all goes back to muscle as the organ of longevity and muscle as the focal point and really leveraging that tissue. It's one of the only tissues that we can control. I mean, we have conscious control over this organ system. 
I can't think of another organ system that we have conscious control over. I mean, you can control your heart rate, but not really. It's not as easy as controlling your bicep. So we have direct input into an organ system that we have manual control over. So is Pilates enough? No. Is Pilates beneficial? Totally. So I'm assuming safe to say your answer would be similar for yoga. Correct. Okay. So just to summarize for everyone, in terms of strength training, in your 20s, do, do as much as you can, probably four, four days, five days a week, go, you know, go to failure, make sure you're doing all the body parts, emphasize legs, 30s, 40s, 50s, beyond, two to three days a week. At least three days a week. At least three. I, I don't think that you should do less. I think that you should do more, and I think it should be focused. Well, so let's talk about that, though, for doing our three days, because recovery is a piece of this. And I'm going to go next to, to protein because protein is a big part of the equation. So is it do you need if we're doing the whole body at one, you know, three days a week, how much time do you need? Is it Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Is it every, That's what every I do. You, OK, that's what so, I do. And I think having again, um, training recommendations are more difficult than diet recommendations because you have a lot of personal um, interplay right? It's, it's not uh, black and white, like, okay, I'm drinking a tea. I know that I consumed this. This was this many ounces versus you're going to the gym and you're squatting, but we don't really know if you're using your legs or if you're using your back or any of these other things. So three days a week, I think is great. You know, if you're talking about maintenance and then doing a high intensity interval training, some kind of high intensity interval training. And then of course, layering in that zone two training, which a lot of people don't have time for. Um, and that's where building it into your schedule is, would be great. The other thing is what becomes very critical here that may be less critical when you are younger is challenging yourself, understanding that there is a, you know, as we become more sage-like, I know that that's more esoteric, but as we become more um, mentally focused, right? Where we are now contributing to the world or contributing to our family, typically the aesthetics and the vanity metrics, you kind of, that becomes less, right? We've all been really into it. And you're, listen, you go to a college um, workout center and there's all the mirrors and everyone's doing biceps. And I would argue that as we mature as individuals, it becomes less externally focused and much more internally focused in our life. That being said, it's at that time where you have to do things that you're growing, challenging, and training yourself in a different way. And now in your 40s, you're doing the maintenance stuff because you don't have time, but you have to layer on something that is going to challenge you that maybe you don't want to do, but that's going to challenge you in a way cognitively where it's also going to challenge you physically. For example, I took up kettlebells. I was always, I did traditional bodybuilding style compound, you know, bodybuilding style compound movements, loved CrossFit, and then needed to challenge myself and took kettlebells, right? Took up kettlebells, kettlebell movements, swings, uh, Turkish get ups, things that perhaps I wasn't good at so that I would continue to progress. And that becomes really critical. And then 60s and 70s, this is where Pilates and yoga are totally valuable, but you have to add in the strength training aspect and adding in other modalities to help augment the strength training, like blood flow restriction, like these, um, you know, like TENS unit stimulus suits. The reason why is because you want to have effective training. It's not just about the time. It's about the effectiveness of what you're doing. And so... I, I want to summarize for everyone it, it, to emphasize if you want to build muscle, you got to push yourself. And so reps need to, weight needs to go up, reps need to go down. Fair to say? Or, or reps or volume. So reps, um, the weight can be the same, but you have to do more, right? It, it, you know, it doesn't have to be super heavy weights all the time. It has to be, it's about the stimulus. Which is what I prefer personally, because of all, you know, I've had a history with sciatica, I've dislocated both my shoulders, it's never got surgery. So like, that's my preference, I would rather do a lot more reps and start to pile on weight. 
And I would say um, going to failure is important. And then I would say tracking your progress. Got it. So and then okay. I'm going to layer in something else. Yes. Now, as you age, not that you're aging, Jason, but as I you am become aging. More it's mature, real. I, 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 aging is real. It, yes. As you become more mature, um, this is where nutritional strategies become key. You can't do what you did when you were younger and be on the Twinkie diet. And listen, I remember eating fries in between training. I mean, you're just eating whatever. But this is really, as that skeletal muscle changes, there's this phenomenon that happens called anabolic resistance. And muscle, again, is this organ system that is a nutrient sensor. Muscle is a nutrient sensor. That's incredible. Meaning it senses protein. It's highly specified. It, and specialized to sense dietary protein. This capacity goes down as you age. Well, let's go there. That, that's the, the next, next big part I, I want to cover with you is protein. So let's start with you know, recovery. So one, I want to cover protein in general in terms of quantity, daily protein in, intake as we think about maintaining and building and does that vary with age and then also men versus women. Obviously, we have to talk about sources, plant versus animal. A lot of people in our audience, myself included, lean plant forward. And then the, the post, post-workout. post You know, I, I can remember just, you know, I remember in high school, I was trying to put on muscle and I had, remember metrics? Yeah, totally. Oh my God, yeah. You know, Metrex, you know, right after you had to have the shake and, and, and everything. So let's start with, okay, I just worked out. What is your rule of thumb for protein consumption post-workout in terms of timing and and quantity and how does that differ you know men versus women in age if we think about body weight obviously yeah certainly so i'll start off by saying the issn which is the international society for sports nutrition has a great consensus paper a uh, recent consensus paper on protein so for any of the people that love to read you can go check out that issn paper I will say that protein, the, the most important thing about protein in terms of a protein hierarchy is how much protein you're getting in in a 24-hour period. You know, you know, not that we're eating 24 hours, but in one day. So for example, how much do you weigh? 200 pounds. 200 pounds. My recommendation for you would be 200 grams of protein, which you're probably thinking, wow, that's a lot. That is at the higher end. It doesn't have to be that high. But I think when we're talking about dietary protein, as we age, it's the most important macronutrient because you have to protect skeletal muscle and skeletal muscle as that nutrient sensing organ goes down. The capacity to sense nutrients, to sense protein goes down, which can be overcome by the protein quantity and quality. So there's that. Now, let me lay out, I know that we're talking about after you train. So before we talk about after you train, I want to talk about the current dietary recommendations for protein. The current RDA, which is the recommended dietary allowance for protein, which is a really bad name because it's allowance sounds like that's all you get, is 0.8 grams per kilogram. That has not changed in the last 30 years. Does that mean that no new protein research has come out? No. New protein, no, new protein research has come out and 0.8 grams per kilogram is likely 50% of what we actually need to optimize skeletal muscle and optimize body composition. 0.8 grams per kilogram is the minimum to prevent deficiencies, the minimum amount to prevent deficiencies. And I'm not so good on kilograms. How does that I'm going to calculate it out for you yeah. right now. Oh, my phone is turned off. Okay. So, um, so if we did 200 pounds, do you have a calculator there? Yeah, I'm doing 0.8 kilograms right now in real time for so we have to do so let's see how much kilograms so you are so 200 divided by 2.2 is what eight kilograms is 17 point let me do hold this on right. go with me here go with me okay 200 sorry. divided by 2.2 is what uh it's gonna be like 80 or so. so that means you're 80 kilograms okay so now multiply that by 0. 0.8 so we're getting down to like 65-ish, I'm going to guess. Is that true? That means that your minimum dietary requirement for protein, your RDA would be 65. I'm going to turn my phone. We're going to do it. Yeah, let's gonna, do it. We're going to do get your this diet right. on the fly. Let's do it. So 200 divided by 2.2. 2. 
So you're about 90 kilograms. So 90, let's see if that's true. Yeah. So let's see, 90 times uh, 0.8. So the RDA for you is 72 grams of protein a day. Wow. So you're saying on the high end, 200 and the RDA is 72. So my question to you, if 72 sounds like way off, well, what's the bare, if 200 is like. 72 grams of protein is your bare minimum. So that's what you think it is? You, no, that according to the RDA. But what do you think? For you, uh, depending on your goal. I would put you like if you wanted to build muscle mass. Maintain. I want to maintain. Maintain slightly. I think most people okay. are probably in maintain and slightly build. Okay. So if you are a maintain and slightly build, uh, well, I mean, so I don't know about slightly building. I would say, let's say 2.2 grams of protein times, let's see, 90. Let's see. Hold on. 90 times 2.2 grams per kilogram. Yeah. 200 grams of protein. So to build, to build or maintain? Oh, to, to build, to maintain, I would be okay with, to, to maintain would be 1.6, double the RDA times 90 would be a hundred, almost 150 grams of protein. Okay. So for anyone listening, male, female, they want to build, essentially it's a gram per pound. Okay. So, so if they want to build muscle, Number one, you have to be in a little bit of a, a calorie excess. So you have to understand your uh, maintenance calories and then add a percent above that. But from a protein perspective, that can be anywhere from 2.2 grams per kilogram or 2.5 grams per kilogram. But I just do the pounds, pounds. So one to one. Yeah. So one gram. So you could do one gram per pound ideal body weight would be great. And if you're looking to maintain, it sounds like it's slightly massive, like slightly less. less. It's like 0.75. Yeah, a little less, but okay. nothing crazy. And, and same, kind of safe to say it's the same for men, women, all it, ages. Okay, it, that's good. So basically, uh, well, when you're younger, the the RDA is a little bit higher. But let's say for the listener, who typically the listener is not going to be, you know, maybe you have some 12 year old listeners, but probably they're busy and um you know safe to say for all the you know for the listener um understanding that the RDA is archaic and the data coming out is double the RDA so that is 1.6 grams per kilogram like you said a little bit less than a, a pound 1 gram per pound I, ideal body weight and about 0.75 if you want to maintain yeah so if you're 100 and uh, 30 pounds times 0.7. Yeah, I think 0.7 is a little low, but yes, that would, again, because we have to understand, now here's where it gets tricky, you ready? Here's where it becomes really important. Right now we think about protein um, as like a percentage of calories, which it should never be thought of. So if um, someone is eating a 1500 calorie diet, then, you know, they might be getting, so if they're 1500 calories, let's see this times, let's say they're going to get, uh, 15% of their calories from protein. Let's see, go with me here. 1500 calories times 0.15 divided by four that gives them. So if they, so let's, let's break this out. Ready? Promise I'll make the math easy. An individual is on a 1500 calorie diet. Seems reasonable. If you are getting 15% of your um, uh, calories from protein, you're gonna be getting 56 grams of protein a day. Now, not enough, and here's why. Are you ready? Now we're moving into the things that are really important for longevity. As you age, it becomes very important to, so, let me just back up. The reason we eat protein is not for the protein, it's for the amino acids. Okay, so there's 20 different amino acids, nine are essential. Our body can make some, but we have to eat those nine essential. And that's really why we're eating dietary protein. Now, what happens is muscle, as I mentioned before, is a nutrient sensor. It's very exquisitely sensitive to one of the amino acids called leucine. 
It's a there's a branch chain amino acid. Branch chain simply just means the structure of the protein. There's a leucine, isoleucine, and valine. This one branch chain amino acid, leucine, is a triggering mechanism that quote turns on skeletal muscle. You ready for the rub? The rub is it requires a threshold amount, meaning you have to have a certain amount hit the bloodstream at one time to trigger this mechanism. When you are younger, that could equate to 10 grams of protein. So you could have one egg and now you've triggered your muscle because you've hit this leucine content and everything is great. As you become more mature, it requires a minimum of 30 grams of high quality protein to trigger muscle tissue. And so you gotta do that multiple times a day. Depends on what your goal is, but minimum to trigger this tissue as you get older from the literature is around 30 grams. And that equates to um, four ounces of chicken or, you know, you know, if it's fish, it's going to be more than that, five or six ounces. Here's the, the catch here is if you eat below that threshold, you don't trigger that tissue. So, so you're going right to sources and plant versus animal. And well, so I'm trying to outline what I'm trying to do is is understand the mechanism as to where these recommendations come from. Like how can we think about it? And it really is that we're eating for these this amino these amino acid needs. Right? So if you have say a hemp protein that you look at the back and it says 30 grams of protein, because the amino acid profile is different, your body may only see 15 grams of protein. So if you're having that plant-based protein, you might need 45 grams to reach that threshold. So you need to look at the leucine content. You do, but guess what? Yeah, so it's not just the protein number, you need to look at the leucine number. And guess what? It's not on the labels. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that, it's not a mistake, oversights, that I have seen in nutritional sciences is that when you look at the back of a label of, I don't know, this, you'll see fat and fat will have saturated fat, trans fat, you know, it, it have all the things. When you look at the label for carbohydrates, it'll have fiber and sugar, right? And then you look at the label for protein, it just says protein. But I just told you that there's 20 different amino acids and that each one of those amino acids does different things. So protein quality is not amplified or specified on the nutrition label. And this is where it becomes really important for the consumer to understand that plant sources of proteins are different than animal sources of proteins. Can you get all the protein you need from an animal source? Yeah, but it's gonna require more and it's gonna require a very conscientious effort. Um, and again, this discussion isn't uh, you know, I really hate to lose people when I say plant versus animal, but we have to think about food as a matrix. So from an amino acid content, these foods are different. So if you have six cups of quinoa, that protein content will equal one small chicken breast. It's a lot. So, so then how, how do you think about density in terms of leucine quality? If you were to pick your, your top you know, three or four plant sources and your top animal sources? Because I think, yeah, because I think people want to minimize. That's a great question. If we are thinking about protein sources just as it relates to amino acids, I would think about soy from a plant source. I would think about soy. I would think about pea isolate proteins. Um, not a huge fan of any kind of processed food in that way. They isolate because they don't exist in nature. So we don't really know the long-term implications of what that is to be, not just the protein, but the other aspects of what's in the pea product, right? Um, so soy, pea isolate, and, and we're just talking about the robustness of the nutrient content. And then um, certain types of beans, legumes. Again, the bioavailability is less because there's fiber, but that's kind of how I would break it down. Um, and then from a animal-based source, I would think about eggs. I think about whey. I think about red meat is a really nutrient-dense source of creatine, iron, zinc. 
um, taurine, these kinds of things, choline, these kinds of things that are very valuable and highly bioavailable. And so in terms of, when I get back to like post-workout, I don't want to forget about that. In terms of, okay, I need to take protein, I've worked out. How do you think about it? We need to look at the whole picture in terms of consumption for the, for the whole day. How do you think about that window and, and the amount we should have? I would say, number one, the data, uh, if you are younger, the post-training window for protein doesn't really matter. So if you're young, you're really robust, uh, it doesn't totally matter. You, as long as you're getting that protein in a 24-hour period, it doesn't matter. Um, as you get more mature, uh, as you get older, the blood flow to the muscle increases post-training. And there's really good data to suggest that older muscle can respond like younger muscle post-training with the addition of dietary protein. So post-training for an older individual or someone with chronic disease or someone who is obese or having weight issues, this is a really key time from an anabolic perspective for allowing muscle to respond like uh, younger muscle. And I know that I'm saying this in absolutes, and there is variability in the literature, but from a, a geriatrician perspective and from someone who thinks about chronic disease, I think it's easy to do, and I think it's valuable. It's easy and it's valuable, and there is data to support that this can have an effect. So I would say 30 grams of protein post-training is a great strategy for nearly everybody. What does that mean? It means a whey protein. Um, I think that that, I mean, whey protein is phenomenal and great. Also, if someone is doing a plant-based protein, as long as the leucine content is high enough, they can always add in a scoop of branch chain amino acids into a plant-based protein. Um, you know, but 30 grams of high quality protein is key. And again, high quality protein typically means an animal-based uh, protein product and quality of protein simply is defined based on the amino acid score. Yeah. So for that point, if you're looking, if you're doing it, if you're doing 30 grams right after a workout, what is the optimal leucine quantity? Two and a half grams. Two and a half grams. And it could be a little bit lower because you've lowered that threshold, right? You've, you lower the threshold because the muscle is primed to receive nutrients, but two and a half grams of leucine, which equals 30 grams of protein is, is a good baseline recommendation for everybody. And that can be found. This is what's so easy is that training recommendations are much more difficult. And I always reference Dr. Andy Galpin because he is, you know, he's phenomenal in this area. And, um, you know, training recommendations are more challenging versus nutritional recommendations, which we can say over, you know, the, the, the amount that someone consumes, we can, we can measure, right? It's not like we're measuring effort. So 30 grams of high quality dietary protein is great. And so... In closing, this is a this is a big question, but I think it relates to everything because look, if we want to maintain muscle, we want to build muscle, we want to be uh, be able to to run and play with our grandkids when we get old. I think it's safe to say we all probably want to minimize fat. If we're doing all these things, is it safe to say we're kind of Assuming we're eating correctly, you know, we're, we, we're, 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 we're doing the right things. We're not having Twinkies and so forth. Safe to say if we, if we are working out three to four days a week, we're doing some hit, we're uh, consuming enough protein, you know, we're, we're not going nuts on sugar and all the things I think our audience knows not to do. You know, we're sleeping. It's safe to say probably going to lose some fat along the way. Absolutely. If you prioritize protein, um, you're now really focused on healthy muscle. Prioritize protein and you're able to regulate your metabolism. And I, I know that that sounds like uh, nebulous. So let's talk about what is regulate metabolism. Um, when you prioritize protein and you're stimulating muscle, muscle goes through a turnover process, which it's always going through. But prioritizing protein allows you to protect and meet the needs of muscle turnover. Muscle is the primary site for glucose disposal. You know, as we think about metabolism, which just means for the carbohydrates that you eat, it's going to your muscle. You know, because you liver and on these places, but the disposal place, the primary healthy disposal place is skeletal muscle. 
in order to have these metabolic effects, you have to have that healthy tissue. Healthy tissue doesn't happen out of nowhere. You do have to rebuild it, and it does have to have the building blocks to do that. And that's where prioritizing protein is really important. The other aspect of that, a couple things, is um, your body, when you ingest dietary protein, can actually begin to generate its own carbohydrates. It goes through this process called gluconeogenesis. So now, instead of having to eat carbohydrates, your body is able to make carbohydrates from dietary protein. So your blood sugar remains more stable as opposed to having these ebbs and flows and being dependent on outside, um, you know, like the outside sugar fix. So dietary protein, if you eat 100 grams of dietary protein, 60 grams gets converted to glucose. And, and I'm saying this in absolutes and there's things that, that play a role in it. But again, for the listener, this is important to know. So they don't actually have to eat. We don't have a dietary need for carbohydrates. Our body can generate it. You prioritize protein. You maintain healthy muscle. Also, dietary protein is very difficult to store as body fat. We don't have a, a reservoir for it. It's much easier to overeat carbohydrates and fat and actually store that. Dietary protein I have never seen anyone gain, and there's studies that show protein overfeeding improves lean muscle mass and doesn't put on body fat. That's amazing. The other thing protein does is it triggers mechanisms that allow for satiation, you know, so you're less likely to overeat. And they have shown this in, uh, out of Heather Leidy's lab, very interesting. And this was in adolescence is, you know, adolescent, uh, you know, women, I guess they're not adolescent women, but adolescent girls, that when you feed them a protein meal at 35 grams, the, they did fMRI studies, which is simply looking at their brain and they the circuits to drive to eat food and um, eat, you know, carbohydrates and junk food was way less. They were much less likely to do that by prioritizing protein first. So there, there's a multiple reasons why uh, dietary protein healthy muscle will impact weight. Fascinating. Got to get your protein. Got to do some strength training. Gabrielle, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.